sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky, for Jesus is my light. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful Jesus show
I'd like to invite all our children to go back and grab your baskets. It's time to pick up the lamb's offering. The lamb's offering, if for those of you who do not know, help fund some of the stuff that goes on down here at our church school. So it goes for a really good cause. So let them shake you down. We'll just use this one. <laughs> Good morning. You guys asleep? Good morning. I knew you guys could talk. So, I've asked Richard up here because I'm going to use, we're going to, he's going to tell me a secret. Now he's going to, I'm going to ask him the exact question, but he's, but I'm going to promise him. I promise you, I won't tell anybody. I won't tell you what your answer is. So tell me what was the favorite food that your mom ever made? Well, I may have to come over sometime for that. So I want to tell you guys something though. I just remembered something. Did you guys know that the sky is green? Yeah, it is. And the grass, no, the grass is blue. You, you, look, you guys have been taught wrong all your life. It's, I'm telling you the truth. So uh, who told you? Who, how do you know? Yeah, but who taught you your colors? Your parents. Your mom and dad. So you're going to take their word over mine? Hmm. Oh, you know what else I heard? His mom's favorite food was haystacks. You know what else he told me? That all the rest of her food was not really that good. Oh, no, I never said that. Let me look at it. And I told you to keep that secret. That's a secret between you and me. You told me that her the favorite food was haystacks, so that must mean all the rest of it was really, really wasn't that good. Oh, no. I loved all her food. I loved all the cooking. Look, example. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you guys, what have I done here today? I lied. So let's go through the lies that I've told. First, I told you the grass is blue and it's not. Your parents were right. I told you the, the sky was green. I also twisted my friend Richard's words here. 
to say something that he never said. But I also did not keep the promise to him that I wouldn't tell anybody. So in Richard's mind, maybe even in your mind too, how trustworthy are my words? Can you believe what I say? What if what I told you was actually the truth? Yeah, I've created doubt in your mind. Sometimes our lies are so subtle. Sometimes lies can be so subtle that it's hard to spot the difference. It's just trying, like what I did with Richard, reading between the lines and saying something he never said, but kind of almost maybe makes sense. So I want to ask you a question. I ran off and forgot this. So I asked Richard to grab it for me. He's still my friend. What is this? So what is the Bible? Very good. It is the Word of God. How strong is God's Word? Can you believe it? But I want to go back to, you didn't answer my first question. How strong is God's word? Strongest thing ever. I like that. Psalms 33 verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. So I want you to consider this. God said, let there be light. And what happened? We're also told in Titus 1 verse 2, that in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So we have a, we serve a God who the Bible says it is impossible for him to lie. Why is it impossible for him to lie? Because if he says something, it happens. God who created, who said the tree, who spoke the trees, this world, everything about this world into existence has made some promises. And that's what's in this book. He has promised that he will help us live the way he wants us to live. He's promised that he's going to come back to get us. And he's gave us his son as a promise to say that if you will accept him, I'll save you. You can live forever with me. Can we believe those promises? Yes. It's impossible for it not to happen because he said it would. Just like you guys knew from your from your being what your parents told you, what color the grass was and what color the sky was, you knew when I was telling you something that was wrong. We can know when we see when the, when the devil whispers in our ear something is wrong. We can know because God told us. So I want to encourage you guys today to pick up the Bible, read it, and if you can't read it, ask your mom and dad to read it because we don't. The devil is trying to trick us, and we don't have to be tricked because he's told us. What do you want to like to say, bro? Okay, let's bow our heads. Our wonderful Father in heaven, Lord, I want to thank you so much for the gift of your word. We can cling to it, we can believe it, because over and over throughout its pages, it, we have illustrations of it. That when you say something, it happens. And I thank you for that assurance, Lord, in your wonderful and gracious name. Amen. morning. Interesting. Our loose, what's loose offering? Anybody know what loose offering is? And, and the, right. 
We have envelopes like this in the back of, in the, in the front of your, where you're sitting. And if you want to go for a specific thing, put it in there. And it's got things you can check off or there's places you can write in there what you specifically want it to go for. Now, it looks like our loose offering today is for uh, North American Division Women's Ministries. And um, so as the deacons come forward and they pass the plates around, uh, please um, um, let's let them... Let's bow our heads. Father, how thankful we can be that we're able to help those. And we pray that as we give, that we will give to you. And that you will bless the blessing, you will bless the offering today. May we do the best that we possibly can. And thank you that we're able to help others. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Now is the special time when we come together as a church family, as brothers and sisters, and we petition our prayers and our prayer requests before the Lord. As close as possible, let's kneel. Father, our precious Savior, we come before you this morning, Father, and we are thankful for this time that we can come together as brothers and sisters and petition before your name. Father, before we come, we ask that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that you would forgive our sins, Father. Father, we ask that you would uh, continue to work in each one of our lives to become more like you. Father, we would like to uplift those that are not here today. Whatever reason it is, whether it's a spiritual or physical sickness, I ask that you would be with them. Be with those that are traveling. Be with those that are not here today for whatever reason. Father, we want to uplift um, our leaders of our church as the decisions are being made, especially this week, decisions that were made, I ask that you would be with those decisions. And mostly important, help us to be a part of that army that finishes the work. Father, I also pray for the leaders of this country. I ask that you would give them wisdom. 
be with those that are in a uniform and protecting our country um, and watch over them as well. Father, we uplift our preacher today. I ask that you would be with him and help his words to come from above. In Jesus' name, amen. is found today in the book of John, chapter 3 and verse 16. And it says here, God loved the people in the world so much that he gave his one and only son on their behalf. So as a result, everyone who believes in the son will not die. Instead, they will live forever with God. When I was in college, I had the chance during my freshman year to walk around the campus and get to see the different buildings. And there was one, that building, called the Keller Auditorium. And I wondered, you know, well, why is it named the Keller Auditorium? 
Well, that was my freshman year. During my second junior year, I got to meet Dr. Keller. He was still alive, and it's kind of nice that they named it after him while he was while he was living. Dr. Keller had a big, booming voice. He would not need a microphone like I need this one. And he started out a lecture. He had he gave one lecture to the class I was in, and he started out with these two questions. He said, "Do you understand? No." Do you see what you're looking at, and do you understand what you know? And then he started asking us specific questions about things that are commonplace to us, like, and I remember the first one, this is a pencil, so what's it made out of? And I, you know, I said, graphite and clay, which was the right answer, but he just went ahead and explained, though, the properties of the graphite and the clay to us that were eye-opening for us. What was the scripture reading? John 3.16. You could probably tell me what that scripture reading is if you say it in King James Version. That's how so many of us memorize it. I really like the way you read it, though, Yuri. And the, the neat thing about that verse is, do you understand what you're looking at? You know, do you see what you're looking at? Do you understand what you know? I'm glad that the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle John to write the gospel according to John this way because when people think of the world in this verse, they'll think of the seven and a half billion people in the world except for themselves. God loves everybody except for me. Have you ever fallen into that trap? of thinking, no, he doesn't really mean me. He means the world, but no, he really doesn't mean me. Well, he really does mean me. There was a song that I used to hear the Sabbath school class next to me when I was a child sing. And it was a song that goes, Whosoever surely meaneth me. Have you ever heard that song? Some of you have. You wouldn't mind singing it with me, would you? Whosoever surely meaneth me. No, I better sing it better than that, shouldn't I? Thank you, dear. Whosoever surely meaneth me, surely meaneth me, yes, surely meaneth me. Whosoever surely meaneth me, whosoever meaneth me. That song really didn't hit me until one time at camp meeting a few years ago. I shouldn't say a few years ago. It was 20 years ago now. Dr. John Kerbs was there from Union College. He was a retired Union College president at the time, but he still got out and gave some really important sermons. And he talked about that song, and he linked it to John 3.16. Whosoever meaneth me. There are a bunch of gasps in the audience when we realize, that's what that song means. Whosoever meaneth me. You might say, but my birth was an accident. No. God still meant to save you. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3. Sorry, Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. It says there in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Uh, that verse is talking about the beast power, but it also, and people worshiping him, but it also mentions the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God planned to save you even before he made the world. So just in case there was something called sin, he was ready for it. Have you ever heard of a game plan? I know I've talked to you about football before, but I have explained a game plan to you. 
There was one time I was listening to a lecture on ministry uh, given at Liberty University. That was its name back then. And the lecturer talked about being invited into the locker room of Auburn University. And there in the locker room, the football players were all, all of them were there, seated, and the three quarterbacks were standing in front of them. And they asked the three quarterbacks, they, had, they could choose any quarterback they wanted, and they asked, had to ask them, okay, second quarter, fourth down, third yard line, five minutes to go, what play do we do? And that quarterback had to say what the play was. Uh, first quarter, third down, uh, our 10-yard line, fourth possession of the game, uh, of that quarter, what play do you do? And that qu quarterback had to say what play he would call at that specific time. The quarterbacks were required to know every possible play in every possible situation of the game. God is really smart. He knows every possible thing to do based on every possible choice that we can make. Do we still have freedom of choice? Yes. Does he know how to respond? Yes. So was your birth an accident? No. One of the problems that we've had in our society with science is that, and I like the way one of the lecturers at General Conference put it this week, science is a tool for us to understand the world. It does not explain everything, but it is a tool that we use to understand the world. And one of the things that has happened with science is we've talked about randomness and things happening slowly and evolving all along. God understands what he's doing. And so when he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that when Mike Burnett believeth in him, he shall have everlasting life, guess what? He means Mike. He also means, where's, where's Yuri? I wanted to pick on Yuri for a moment. He's back there. So, you know, Hayden, Rob, Doug, all of us, he has us all in mind. He knows what it takes to save us. And he is ready to do it. The plan of salvation was, was conceived before mankind was created, and God knew a way for everybody to be saved. Don't expect... Russ here today? Yes, there you are. So don't expect God to be walking across a golf course in heaven and suddenly go, oh, I didn't expect that person to be born. No, he expected everybody that he is going to save. And he's going to save everybody he possibly can. It's still their choice. But God can think. You know, while people might argue about how long the earth has been around, you notice the difference between it and the moon. They were designed differently. Think about that. Does the moon have an atmosphere with as much oxygen as ours does? No. And even though sin occurred, do we still have oxygen? Yeah, I need to quit answering my own questions. Do we still have oxygen? 6,000 years now. Has anybody ever made a car that can last 6,000 years? You are correct. We're not that smart, but God is that smart. He can think. He knows what he's doing. And it is us humans who grapple with the idea of salvation being there, including each one of us. Pastor Abel gave a great sermon last week, though, when he introduced the uh, topic about the Ten Commandments is that it pertains to the mind. He was thinking, he was talking about our thoughts. Believing in God, believing on God, also has the mind involved in two ways. You have to believe in God, and you have to believe that you are that whosoever he came to save. And there's, people have difficulty with both of those. So let me just make it simple for you. God exists, and you are the whosoever he came to save. Amen? Now notice that the verse does not read, 
For God so loved the church that he gave. It talks about more than the church. Although God does love the church, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave. And if everybody in the world chose to believe in God's son, God would save all of them. There is no quota that he has to fulfill and say, oh, you're one too many. No, he would save everyone if everyone chose him. Do you like that? I'm glad you do. Believing on him is the crux of the matter. Now, you notice I'm not talking about John 3.16 in order, because who did I start with? Whosoever. What am I talking about now? Believe it. What am I going to go to next? Let's go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. The Gospel of John, that is. John chapter 1, verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. Receiving God leads to believing in God. To receive him, which then leads to the power to have to, to uh, the ability to push out and push away cravings, the withdrawals, have the victory that thousands of believers have had over the ages. Sometimes they have to leave a part of their lives, but God gives them life to replace that part of their lives, and He gives it more abundantly too. So, not just addictions are overcome, gossiping is overcome, lying is overcome, cheating on taxes is overcome. What do you believe about God? That's an important thing, too. That is where many people start to accept a lie. Let me ask you this. How does John 3.16 start? For God did what? I can't hear you. He loved. Our God is a God who loves. He is very capable of that. He knows how to do that, and he does it, like everything else, very, very well. You know, to many people, God in the Bible is a supernatural, superpowered version of something evil or something random. He is not. He is a loving God. He is trustworthy. Read the Bible See all that God says in it. See what it says about God. See what it says about the people who loved him. See what it says about the people who disobeyed him. Ask who, what, why, when, where, and how. And then use other verses to answer your questions. And that's how you build a picture of God. It takes strength to believe in God, too, though. Think about that. Anybody here gone canoeing? Yeah, I have as well. So when I first heard about rowing, though, and canoeing, I was kind of surprised at that. So we had a ladder. We were all small children then, uh, my siblings and I, and there was a short ladder that was in the yard. I can't remember where it came from or anything. So we got on that ladder, and we got some sticks, and we pretended that we were rowing. Did we go anywhere? Right, we were just pretending. Well, later on, 13 years later, I had a chance to go canoeing. And this was great. I mean, real canoe, real water, real paddles, get in there. And, you know, and I had to ask, well, how do you do this? How do you do that? You know, how to put on the life vest and all of those things. But I got all those things on, and we started paddling. And guess what? Did we go anywhere? Yes, we did. So at one point, though, my friend Paul Brown and I, here we are canoeing together, and Somebody needed some help upstream. So we had to turn around and paddle upstream to get the item that someone had left behind. How easy do you think that was? 
It's not that easy. It's easy to paddle with the current, but it's not that easy to paddle against the current. Believing is like that. You can believe in God when it's easy to, like when you're here in church, it's easy to believe in God. But when you're out during the week and you have some challenges to face and you really need to believe in God, it's like paddling against the current. But can you do it? Yes, you can. It takes strength to believe in God. There is an anal- so there's an analogy of what that strength is like. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, please. We're going to start hopping around in our Bibles right now. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're talking about the ability to believe. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 2 and 3 says, Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away with these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. We get that strength to believe from the Holy Ghost. So sometimes if you're struggling to believe, ask God for the strength to believe. And guess what? Who has the abundant strength to give to you? Amen. Let's go to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. That's in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Numbers 14, verse 24. Numbers 14, verse 24. In Numbers chapter 14, you have a scary story there where God has been leading the people through the wilderness to the promised land, and once again, they give in trouble, except this time they're really, well, They've been pretty bad already, but this time they actually refuse to enter the promised land because of their fears. Then verse 24, here's what God says about one man. He said, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherein he went and his seed shall possess it. Of the 12 spies that went into the promised land, how many, uh, this is 12 spies that went and checked out the promised land to see what it was like. How many of them actually got to go into the promised land? Right. So 12 went in, checked it out, gave a, 10 of them gave a bad report. Two of them said, God said we can take this land. One of them was Caleb. Caleb had that different spirit. Build up your courage in God so that when you have scary moments, you can say, God said. When we were studying in in the Sabbath school class that I'm involved in, we were studying the book of Genesis, and there were times when Abraham had to think about something, but God had given him a covenant saying, this is what I will do. I'm going to give this land to your descendants. He made different decisions based on that. And he was always correct in those decisions because God, I shouldn't say always correct, he did have extra sons, didn't he? And God had to to come to him and say, uh, you and Sarah will have a son. But in many other ways, though, he made decisions based on what God said. And he came through, he believed thoroughly what God said told him that that God would do. Base your decisions on what God says too. And do your best to understand him. Let's go to Revelation 14, verse 4. 
How far are you willing to go to follow God? How far are you willing to go? Revelation 14, verse 4 is talking about 144,000 here. And I'm not going to get into the debate about whether that is literal or symbolic. It does describe them, though. And here's what Revelation 14, verse 4 says. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they, and this is the point I want to make here, which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. They were willing to follow the Lamb where? Wherever he goes. That's right. Now, wait, Winston. You said that the Holy Spirit gives me strength to believe and that I cannot even say that Jesus is Lord except, without, except by the power of the Holy Spirit I'm able to say Jesus is Lord. So, what part do I play in this? What part do I choose? You might be wondering, okay, with God giving us so much strength to do things, what part do we do? Choose to put faith in God. Put faith in God, who so love that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The current of our lives is to live for a while in sin, then die. Going against the current is to choose to live in the righteousness of Christ, walk in newness of life, rise from the grave he did, like he did, and live forever with him. Let's look at the part of John 3.16 that says, Only begotten Son. You know, in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 3, almost all of those men listed there in that genealogy of Jesus, Almost all of those men are the son of men. But there, there are two exceptions in there. One is, who is Adam the son of? And who is Jesus the son of? Yes, that's right. And uh, you might also wonder, too, as an aside, why are the genealogies different between Matthew and Luke? Well... They all start out the same, basically. I know one's in reverse while the other one goes forward. One is the genealogy of Mary. The other one is the genealogy of Joseph. In both, though, Jesus is the son of David. In Matthew, he's the son of David through Solomon. And in Luke, he's the son of David through uh, Solomon's next older brother, Nathan, who was one of the four sons of Solomon and Bathsheba. Sorry one of the four sons of David and Bathsheba. So when you see Nathan there, that's his next oldest brother. Solomon was the youngest of the four sons of David and Bathsheba. So he's still the son of David both ways. In the Garden of Eden, we're introduced to the seed of the woman who had crushed the serpent's head. And in Isaiah 9, verse 6, we are reminded, for unto us a child is born. Why is Jesus the Christ begotten of God and a woman. I'll give you the answer that I see in the Bible uh, just from putting different things together. It's so that no one can say he doesn't belong. He belongs to God. It's true. Just he belongs to God, period. He also belongs to humankind because he is a descendant of of a human. Jesus is the Son of God and he is our cousin. Think of it that way. My last name is Reed, R-E-I-D. It turns out that all of the Reeds, R-E-E-D, R-E-A-D, R-E-A-D-E, R-E-E-D, R-E-I-D, all of us have the name, all of our names come from the name Dalreda. There are Four different last names historians think belong to the legendary King Arthur. And one of them is Dalreda. No, I'm not a descendant of King Arthur because he and his son really did uh, kill each other in battle. See, he has no descendants. 
However, you know, you might get excited saying, thinking, oh, wow, Winston could be his cousin. Well, here's the really big news. All of us are cousins of Jesus. We all are. You are related to Jesus. It's an incredible thing when you realize it. He is part of the human family. Biologically, we're all his cousins. So let's look at the beginning of John 3.16 3, again. And um, think of, now let's think about something else. Because it says in there that God gave. The word gave in Greek is different from the word sent in Greek. In the word in John 3.17, it says, For God sent not his Son into the world. Why? Yeah, to condemn it. He didn't just send Jesus. What happened on Mount Sinai when when God came down to Mount Sinai and spoke to people. The mountain looked like it was on fire. There was a big earthquake. And where ev was everybody just like really happy and welcoming and saying, oh, it's so good to see you? They were scared. In fact, they told Moses, please, we can't handle his talking to us. We will die. You go and talk to him instead. So... God didn't just send Jesus. He gave Jesus. The word for gave, uh, another translation for gave, uh, from that Greek word, demato. I did not pronounce it properly. You could look it up, though. Uh, another word for that uh, Greek word is committed. Jesus and the Father committed Jesus to humankind. Think about it. After he rose from the grave, what kind of body did he have? He had a glorified human body. When you look at John chapter 21, and he's talking with the disciples, and Thomas says, you know, you guys, you're having delusions. You didn't see him. So Jesus appears to them eight days later. And Thomas is there, and he says, Thomas, put your finger through these holes in my hands. Thrust your hand up my side. Jesus had the scars to prove that he had gone to the cross for us. Let's go to Exodus chapter 21. Actually, let's go to Philippians chapter 2 first, and then we're going to go to Exodus chapter 21. Philippians chapter 2 talks about that commitment that Jesus had. And we're asked to be like him. Starting at verse 5, Philippians 2, Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. When in the Sabbath school class that I belong to, We've studied the book of Genesis, like I've talked about, and we came to the book of Exodus. And Exodus chapter 20 is the one that contains the Ten Commandments, of which our pastor has spent, you know, spent 11 weeks talking about the Ten Commandments. And it was really good. And then along comes chapter, and then he says a little bit more about idolatry and, uh, and altars, explaining the difference between the two. And then the next thing that God talks about, now he's just talking to Moses in chapter 21, he starts, he starts talking about servants. And I wondered when I was studying this, getting ready for the, to be able to teach this in class, why talk about servants? Why choose this topic? 
And so I prayed about it. I simply asked God, why? And I know that God's going to answer my question. As I continue to read the Bible, I will start understanding why, because he'll help me to put things together. And when I was going, filling in the outline of the sermon, the first place I preached the sermon was at the, with the congregation that I grew up going to church with in Kingsville, Missouri, a congregation in which I was baptized. And I realized something about the judgments made upon servants in Exodus chapter 21. Servanthood is very dear to God's heart. It says there in verse 2 of Exodus 21, If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and the seventh he shall go free for nothing. So why does God talk about how to treat servants? Jesus was not sent just to do us a favor. Jesus was given. He was committed, and he became a servant. Servanthood was very close to his heart. So finally, the Holy Spirit helped me to see, oh, Philippians chapter, sorry, not, yeah, that was Philippians 2. He took upon himself the form of a servant. So this chapter here in chapter 21 then becomes really important. What can we learn about Jesus being a servant compared to servanthood as it's talked about in chapter 21. One of the things that, that we come across, well, there are several things that we come across. One thing is that servanthood is dangerous. A master can beat a servant. Look at verses 20 and 21 of Exodus chapter 21. It says there, and if a man smite his servant or his maid with a rod, and he die under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, he shall not, shall not be punished, for he is his money. Being a servant is very difficult. God wanted to point out the reality of that to us. Let's look at something else then about servanthood. Going back to Luke chapter 18. Let's go to Luke chapter 18. We're going to look at verses 31 to 33. Luke 18, 31 to 33. Then he took unto him the twelve, and he said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. And sure enough, from the time that he was delivered unto the Gentiles to the time he rose again, Three days. Jesus died in service. Humankind killed Jesus with rods of nails through his hands and through his feet. Humankind certainly deserves death for what they did to Jesus. And the risen Christ deserves to walk away free from humankind because he's free from service. We killed him. He's done, but he does not. Let's go to Exodus 21, verses 3 to 6. Back to Exodus 21 we go. And then we're going to come back to the New Testament again, different place. If your Bibles are worn out, you can blame me. Exodus 21, verses 3 to 6. It says more about servanthood here. It says... If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. 
And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his servant shall bring him unto the judges. He shall bring him also to the door or unto the doorpost. And his servant shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. So after that, after that servant has committed himself and says, I don't want to go free. I want to serve forever and ever. Every time that servant comes home, he sees his blood there on the door or on the doorpost. He sees his blood stained there. You know, or he might feel a little tinge in his ear, you know, from the hole that's made there every now and then because he has chosen to serve forever and ever. There is a cross somewhere in time where Jesus chose to serve us forever and ever too. And so his blood stained that cross. He committed to us. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. You know the interesting thing about that? He wasn't even married to us yet. But he chose to commit to us. Ephesians chapter 5, please. I know, it kind of reminds me of the story of Jacob also. Sees Rachel, hey, I will serve seven years for her. Mm. Serve to marry. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Christ loved the church. Let's go to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. I'm staring at Revelation 22. It's a great chapter too, but I need to be with the same chapter as you. Revelation 21, verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall his, be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Isn't that great? We'll be united together. So, yes, God really gave. He really committed. Are you grateful for that? Do you believe that? Will you accept it? Okay, show me. Why don't you stand? Show me that you accept it. Why don't you stand? I shouldn't be the only one standing here. Verse 4 of Revelation 21 says this, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Again I ask, are you grateful? Do you believe and will you accept? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm really thankful for what you have done. I know for our forefathers before Jesus came, it was looking forward to what that Savior would do and believing it. 
we got to look back and see and believe. We're both called upon to believe. Help us really to believe. Help us to believe through this week to come. Help us to believe all the way through to the second coming and then beyond that as well because we'll get to be with you then and it'll be great to actually be with you all the time. Help us to look forward to that and invite everyone we can to that. In Jesus' name we pray, please. Amen. Please remain standing. We'll have our closing song. Our closing hymn is number 190 in your hymn, hymn book, uh, Jesus Loves Me. announcement before we dismiss this morning. I want to remind everyone that at four o'clock today there is a memorial service here in the sanctuary at the church for our dear sister Nina Rodman and everyone is welcome and invited to attend that. So let's bow our heads this morning as we close. Heavenly Father we we read and we believe the words this morning. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And Lord, my prayer for each and every one of us is that we believe and we are willing to follow him wherever he may go and surrender all in our lives to his will. We ask that you keep us now as we dismiss our service. Be with us this week. In Jesus' name, amen.